Okay, everyone, I am going to uh, welcome everyone to the Pat's June 9th Technical Committee meeting. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. We have a fairly full house of members, but also non-members online. So we have the registrations for everyone. We have that documented. That'll be reflected in the minutes. Um, but with that, um, for today's meeting, we wanted to uh, start with um, two different presentations. Oh, there's Jeff Knight. Uh, two different presentations. These are studies um, that were done by others. I think the first one was PennDOT Connects funded. Uh, Jennifer and the second one was Dolphin County funded. So, um, you know, in, in a nutshell, we wanted to learn a little bit about both studies today because they're going to be tools for us as we enter into the tip development process and start doing the work with the municipalities and things, having these studies in hand. So, wanted to share the findings with uh, with the committee so that you're aware of what we're going to be considering moving forward. So. With that, I am going to turn it over here to Jennifer. Jennifer, do you have slides you want? Do you want to share your screen? I do have slides and I'm happy to share my screen. Let me get that right. pulled up. I am going to stop sharing and let you share. Okay. There we go. Let's try that. Here we go. You should hopefully be seeing my screen. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Welcome everyone, or good morning, I should say. Uh, my name is Jennifer Warner Heyman. I am a traffic engineer with Michael Baker International. I am going to be sharing today uh, a quick summary of the post road improvement study. Uh, as was noted, this is a PennDOT Connect study uh, contracted through PennDOT Central Office, right? Uh, we had a steering committee for this study that included members from uh, local townships, the uh, borough adjacent, right? Uh, we had uh, the Economic Development Corporation involved, the planning department, uh, as well as the barracks. Uh, you will see why the barracks in just a moment here, but Needless to say, we had a very strong steering committee for this project, uh, but in a nutshell, the post road improvement study is all about taking a look at post road, which is just uh, to the east of the Carlisle barracks, it, it, it borders the barracks, uh, and looking at evaluating what are the existing conditions out there and how can we make improvements to provide for better travel options for those multimodal users, right? So we have vehicular lanes out there now, uh, but how can we better accommodate those pedestrians and bicyclists? So that in a nutshell was, was the goal of this study. Uh, it was, uh, let's say, started because of a construction project on the barracks. Uh, there was an access added <laughs> on Post Road and they realized, you know, maybe we wanna put a pedestrian access gate on Post Road. And thinking about that, saying, okay, now then, what is that travel experience for pedestrians who would want to be accessing that access gate? So that's really the, the, the goal of this study, the, the impetus. Uh, so this study involved uh, virtual public meetings. We had stakeholder interviews with various groups in the community. We created a, po a project website. There were some surveys, right, done, two different surveys to, to gather input about public uh, experiences on Post Road and to, to bounce the ideas uh, off of the public to get their feedback. There was some engagement there, right? We also had uh, extensive data collection. We went out in the field, right? We did some, some counts, some studies, some photos, videos, et cetera. Um, we have shared the uh, study with you, but essentially we have 18 pages of lovely visuals with uh, lots of pictures in that report summarizing all the, the various aspects of post roads. So regional context, land use context, uh, the roadway itself, uh, the bridges, bridge conditions, the traffic, right? Stormwater management pieces, environmental, et cetera, et cetera. So if you are at all interested in doing a deep dive into post road, feel free to take a look at uh, the uh, report in the agenda. Uh, so post road itself, you may or may not know, likely familiar with it, uh, but essentially the a relatively short roadway, right? Um, but there's quite a bit of vertical elevation change uh, 
along that roadway. It's a little bit curvy, right, is what we like to say. Um, so the travel experience uh, for both drivers and pedestrians is that it, you go for a little bit of a ride along this little short road, right? You've got a, a little bit of a blind curve in the middle. You can see that here. Uh, there's uh, some curvy experiences, horizontal curves, right? Uh, here and here over the bridges. And it's uh, a relatively narrow roadway. You see that in the picture here. Uh, we collected uh, traffic counts as well as speed data. You can see that here. Uh, it is posted at 35 miles per hour. The speeds that we're seeing are relatively consistent with that. Um, we also did traffic counts, right? We're not seeing any, any major crazy uh, <laughs> uh, numbers here, but essentially what I'm going to point out that's important here is that you see there's a slight difference uh, in, the, say, the peaks uh, in the morning and the afternoon. You can see the southbound direction is a little bit higher peak in the morning, right? And then there's another peak in the afternoon, essentially consistent. We're seeing some commuter traffic on this roadway, but there's also other uses in the area, right? All right, so we surveyed the public <laughs> about uh, their vision for post road, and this is what they told us. Wider travel lanes, wider shoulders, slower speed limits, dedicated spaces for bikes, pedestrians, improved sight distance and visibility, reduce the blind curves and hills, and possible relocation of the compost site access. Now we shared uh, the existing conditions of the roadway and this public vision with the steering committee and had extensive conversations around what uh, the steering committee saw as the vision for post road. How did they see post road fitting into the network? Um, and ultimately uh, came to consensus around the following ideas, that post road uh, should not be designed as a major regional thoroughfare for vehicles, right? That they, they preferred that that roadway context stay local. Uh, they also uh, came to consensus that post road should be designed in a way that reinforces those lower speeds and safety for all users. So we're not looking at big wide lanes, wide shoulders. We know we heard that from the public, but I think there's a mismatch based on what they were shared that they want lower speeds, right? And so we said, okay, we're going to avoid over widening and avoid correcting any roadway elements that can serve as natural speed enforcers. And then finally, I uh, came to consensus that any multimodal improvement design should be consistently applied across the full length of the corridor. We didn't want to see a piecemeal, you know, this design on this section, that design on the next section. They wanted a consistent approach all the way across. So our team took that uh, and came up with three conceptual alternatives and some overarching elements for uh, this study. And we took those and we evaluated them against major design considerations you've likely seen these types of categories before. Cost right away, stormwater impacts, safety, level separation between users, right? Contextual design. Uh, so here are those three alternatives on the screen. Uh, the three that were considered were a sidewalk option on one side, a shared use path option on one side, and then a sidewalk on one side with bike lanes on both sides. Obviously, if you can see, it's a very different feel if you go from option A to option C. Um, each of these were evaluated for the pros and cons. I'm not gonna walk through each of these based on time, but if you're interested, feel free to dive in a little bit more. And we also took a look and did a high level, very, very high level planning cost estimate uh, to take a look at the comparison between the different options. So you can really see if you go from option A to option C, uh, we're looking at you know uh, almost three times difference uh, between those two, two to three times. So just important to note, right? I, we also have a summary of some of the overarching elements, right? Bridge reconstruction because the bridges are very narrow. So any any of these options we need to have some sort of bridge widening, right? Uh, intersection treatment options, mid-block crossings. Feel free to take a look at those in the report. So we took these concepts and we. Uh, posted a survey to the public so that they could tell us what they thought uh, about those options. Uh, and we asked and said, okay, so based on the steering committee's conversations, option A was the current preferred option. What do you think about it? Um, we had mixed results, to say the least. So there were uh, some who felt that it was agreed that it's the most cost-effective option, it would be sufficient. Others wanted to see significantly more uh, 
let's say, features out there for, for multimodal use. Ultimately, what the steering committee came to the decision uh, was that concept A is the preferred alternative moving forward as it appears to be the most cost-effective option to meet the needs of all users. We have uh, some of those other elements of the decision-making why this option was the ultimately preferred alternative summarized uh, here and in the report. Feel free to take a look, but in a nutshell, that is the post-road improvement study. Any questions for me? Jennifer, I'm gonna start. I just have one question for yeah. you. So if, so if you're able to move forward with option A, yeah. Does that feed into an eventual, maybe you get to needing an option B at some point in the future? Does it build upon, a, you know, or is there any kind of duplicative things there that are potentially problematic? Yeah, it's a great question. So we didn't design the concepts with the thought that these would be, you know, start with A, move to option B, then move to option C. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, the constraints, and I'm going to pull up Google Maps while I'm chatting because I think will make it a little bit easier to walk through this piece. Give me one moment here. All right. Uh, so post road uh, in various sections is very close to the barracks fencing uh, right here. And so, as you can imagine, uh, the option that has a bike lane on each side, there would need to be a realignment of the roadway in those sections that are very close to the fencing. As you can imagine, uh, <laughs> once you realign the roadway, that's a very different scale of project. Um, so right now, concept a, where you put a sidewalk on, we'll turn it in the direction we're looking, on this side, the roadway realignment is not required. So if we think about, you know, if, if you were trying to phase it in, the sidewalk, if you were going to construct it with the long-term vision in mind of wanting bike lanes on there, it would have to be significantly further over um, and more right-of-way would need to be purchased. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Appreciate that. Yeah. I just want to, Kirk, you were involved in this. Did you have anything you wanted to add to this? Or? Sure. I, I think when you look at, at post road, road, it's kind of a unique study that, you know, it wasn't, it's not an area where there's there's a hotbed of a lot of activity or a lot of problems. I think it was, this was forward looking, really trying to make some connections between the, the Army barracks and then some of the surrounding residential developments. The Army barracks is also building some new facilities uh, that likely draw some more traffic. And they were looking at pedestrian gate off of opportunities. I think may, making that connection between the surrounding community and the Army barracks was, was a really a critical point of study. Also, if you look at Claremont Road and you look at US 11 on both sides of, of post road that are bounding the project, neither of those are, are overly bicycle and pedestrian friendly. So we're trying to, to design a solution that would, that would work here, but wasn't over designed uh, and take too many resources, we'd never see anything happen. So I think we have a a pretty good uh, compromise here of, of meeting the needs, but in a context sensitive way. Uh, I know that the township uh, is, is moving ahead. They, they want to uh, move forward with implementation. So they're taking steps to do that, which is always the focus of our study. Right. We want to see them move ahead. So we're hopeful to see that coming in the future. Yeah, cool. Anybody else have any comments or questions for Jennifer um, before we go on to our next study? Uh, yeah, Jeffrey Knight, uh, just one question. Um, so it looks like this is kind of one of the only connecting points between uh, 11 and uh, whatever the street is there, North Street. Um, so it seems kind of even more critical that you'd have some sort of um, bike facility there or accommodation, especially because that was kind of the intent of the um, uh, study. And it looked like the bike, the shared use path only required an extra of four feet of right of way. Is there a reason why it was just stopped at the sidewalk and not having a shared use path that would really actually serve all of the um, uh, users? It's a great question. So we looked at what would be required to have a, a wider shared use path uh, adjacent to the roadway. So for shared use paths, uh, typically, you want to have some separation between the roadway and the path. There's, there's a required uh, separation distance. You can see that in, in the visual here, right? You can either have uh, a curb or you can have 
grass and then the path. Um, so it's more than just, you know, two extra feet or, or four extra feet. Um, and once we start looking at that, um, down here on the southern end of Post Road, there are uh, some landscaping elements for to add privacy for these homes uh, that would absolutely be impacted along with the utilities. Um, and once we're talking about utility moves, it's a very different scale of project. So that was one of the major motivators. However, in addition to that, um, we did talk about in this type of context, it's not unusual for bicyclists to use the sidewalk, right? Um, and for those users who would be uncomfortable being in the roadway as a cyclist, they could certainly use the sidewalk. So that was that was the conversation point here. Um, well, I mean, it looked like the separation was the same between a sidewalk and like the uh, option B light there and that two feet either way. Um, so, you know, I don't know. It just seems like this is kind of an incremental step when maybe a more thorough uh, project would kind of future proof the corridor for all uses. Yeah, I will say another uh, piece that we took into consideration, there, there are some conversations uh, with some local recreational uh, groups that are looking at some trail off-road trails in this Latorte Spring area and making connections in some way that way. And so because those decisions have not been finalized yet, um, weren't sure exactly where the connection would be made, but there'd be maybe some other pieces, right, uh, uh, for off-road options. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else for Jennifer? All right, Jennifer, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, Yep. You, so we'll move from Jennifer sharing to Mr. Emberg sharing again this what he's going to overview in the 39 study uh, was funded through uh, Dolphin County. So, uh, Brian, if you wouldn't mind giving us a similar summary. Sure. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Uh, have we seen the screen? Yes. OK, great. Uh, yeah, we, we've uh, completed a, a study, a little bit bigger corridor uh, to be focused on. It's the Route 39 to 743 corridor. As Steve mentioned, this was uh, a joint collaboration between Dauphin County and Tri-County. And uh, it's a, um, uh, for the, these limits, it's about a 20 mile total between 743 and Route 39 going from the river all the way through Susquehanna Township, Lower Paxton, West Hanover, and through South Hanover, but stopping at the uh, Derry Township line. And then over here, beginning at the Derry Township line, all the way up through East Hanover, up to um, I-81. Um, because the corridor is, is very long, um, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, but the, the, uh, the purpose uh, why this was started, and it was started several years ago, uh, was uh, public concerns about what's going on along these corridors with regard to land use, either um, uh, ongoing development or potential development, uh, and the capacity and the safety issues that traffic from that's being attracted to these corridors uh, was creating. So the objectives of, of the study was to identify corridor capacity and safety needs and what the uh, requisite mitigation measures would be. Um, but in concert with that, to evaluate existing land uses and zoning, and then make recommendations to mitigate future impact on the transportation network. Uh, it, we just didn't want to build more capacity and encourage more, more, more traffic because of that. And then finally, uh, evaluate if any improvements on the secondary roadway network might, might uh, help mitigate the quarter uh, uh, congestion. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, we're looking at over 20 miles. So it's just not one consistent uh, approach in that 20 miles. There's a lot of differences if you're familiar with these, these corridors. So what we wound up doing is breaking them down into character areas. And they were uh, smaller sections that had, had uh, land use similarities 
And um, as you can imagine, they're not necessarily constrained by municipal boundaries. Uh, we just didn't want to do Susquehanna Township or Lower Paxton Township in, in those sections. It really should be along the character of the, of the corridor. So this is what uh, the 39 character areas look like. Um, the, the first character area comes from Front Street and uh, stops at Crooked Hill Road in, in Susquehanna Township. Uh, the second character area picks up there, goes through um, Susquehanna over to Lower Paxton at uh, to Colonial Road. Uh, this character area is around the village of Linglestown. Um, this one, four, is out near Central Dolphin High School. You come around through the interchange uh, on 81, and then uh, the last section is down from 81, or that area down to uh, access into um, Derry Township. 743 was broken down uh, just in two, um, and uh, it's mostly rural. This first one is rural uh, area from Derry Township up on Allentown Boulevard, and then in here it's uh, getting into the access of um, I-81. So um, the, I'm eventually going to show you where the study is. It's voluminous. Uh, it's chock full of uh, different infrastructure strategies, projects, cost estimates, uh, a wide variety, as you can imagine, um, and uh, just not necessarily one big capital project. But uh, what we're going to do is just give a brief overview by character area of uh, what the infrastructure strategies are and the land use strategies. So in uh, character area one, uh, the, uh, I'll start with, I'll go backwards here. The land, the land use uh, uh, is that uh, this area is, is mostly developed already. There's very little that can be done uh, to, um, in new development uh, to mitigate what's going on with regard to traffic. What, whatever there is, there ought to be, a, the, we're recommending looking at interconnecting neighborhoods uh, and the pedestrian network to and um, limit the use of cul-de-sacs and create more connectivity offline to reduce um, uh, the impact on the corridor. Um, with that said, though, the, this would be to widen uh, 39 uh, to two through lanes in each direction and consider narrowing lanes uh, to help keep traffic slower and then <clears throat> install a median uh, that would preclude, preclude, le uh, preclude left turns, except obviously at signalized intersections. Um, and that can almost be like a boulevard type of a, an arrangement as well. It just doesn't need to be uh, striped, um, line striping. And then provide bike lanes on both sides and a sidewalk along one side. There we go. <clears throat> All right, character area two. This goes from uh, Crooked Hill Road up to Colonial Road. Um, again, this is largely developed. Um, there's only modest additional commercial and residential development that, that is going to occur that can be mitigated. Um, the new town center area will promote um, um, a lot of activity that stays on site through its mixed use and transit friendly lifestyle. Um, and then uh, where there is um, parking lots and through these other uses is to look to try and connect them to increase uh, uh, pedestrian movement uh, offline. In this section, uh, we're looking at uh, widening to two lanes in each direction uh, and a center left turn lane because we have uh, lots of different access point. Access management is, is an issue in this section. Um, and to provide bike lanes on both sides and sidewalk on at least one side. Uh, consider the extension of Continental Drive to connect neighborhoods north of uh, Route 39, uh, but uh, that won't be the total solution to what's necessary in this character area. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, access management for new and uh, redevelopment sites uh, should really be emphasized and coordinated. Uh, character area three, that's the village of Linglestown. Um, there's a um, significant development in this area should be discouraged. Uh, the whole concept of the roundabout the system is working very well, but it does not have the ability to handle much more capacity and is really not scalable. 
Um, and we'll get to that when we get to the next, uh, that issue when we get to the next uh, character area. Um, this is the, in terms of the transportation system, this is the highlight of the corridor. It's, it's a success story for the existing traffic that it's handling uh, and it's handling it well. Um, so really the infrastructure in here, strategies are to um, uh, consider on-road markings for bicycle traffic and, and really that's it. Character area four, um, intensive development in this area should be discouraged because any traffic that comes out of this is gonna to wanna to go through Langlestown. And as I mentioned before, that's really not a scalable section. Um, and so there, this is an area where zoning changes should be considered uh, to de decrease the uh, development intensity. Um, and right now the uh, strategy would just be to provide a shared youth path along one side. The interchange area, um, there is uh, capacity here to support interchange type development. Uh, we encourage abutting community, uh, commercial property to interconnect again, that, that's a constant theme you've heard to try and keep uh, uh, traffic off of the main line for when it's just moving to from one use to another. Um, would recommend widening to provide a center turn lane through the, this area, uh, bike lanes and uh, sidewalk on both sides uh, within the interchange area because you have uh, all sorts of uses on both sides and a lot of traffic moving through here. Um, <clears throat> character is six, uh, again, widened to provide a consistent center turn lane um, bike lanes on both sides, north of Shetland Drive, and a continuous shared youth path south of Shetland Drive, um, and consider a new roadway link from Road Top, Red Top Road to Hayshed Road. Uh, th this can support some uh, development, but uh, we're recommending uh, in the neighborhood style um, of development. Jumping over to 743, uh, really a different corridor uh, and different uh, character area. Um, it's largely undeveloped with, uh, actually there's minimal development pressures in the next 20 years. Uh, so we're thinking to allow agricultural and conservation and homes to be placed where they're best meet the community preservation goals. Um, there's a lot of uh, study and consideration for, uh, they have a, a, an extensive plan for internal trails and collector trails that should be promoted. Um, most of the intersections here don't meet traffic signal warrants. Uh, roundabout should be considered to improve access from side streets and to calm traffic. Um, and uh, just in the normal management of vehicular speeds and truck traffic and, and enforcement in this area. And this is something that you're going to see in the next two sections. It's, it's beyond the scope of this study, but uh, this whole area on the side of the county, uh, and it's been talked about in various circles over the years, is to consider um, uh, a bypass of this of this corridor from 81 um, through Hershey all the way to the Turnpike. And as you can imagine, that's a much bigger scale, much bigger um, impact, um, but would would be transformational, not for this area, but actually for the entire region about, if you think about the interstate connectivity there. And finally, um, uh, the last section, uh, running all the way up to 81, uh, development opportunities exist without significant quarter impacts due to the proximity of the interchange. Uh, we're looking at pedestrian and vehicular interconnection against, again, between um, residential properties or developments. Uh, and similar to the last section, consider roundabouts um, and provide pedestrian and bicycle connectivity. And again, the, the, the idea of a bypass is something that might be considered in the future. So it, it, as I mentioned earlier, the study is voluminous. That's not the purpose of this presentation. It's just to, uh, primarily to make everybody aware that it's done. It's out there. It's available through the Tri-County Regional Planning Commission website under the Dauphin County page. Um, and uh, finally, I'll wrap up is where do we go from here? Uh, when you look at this study, as I mentioned, it's there's multiple projects ranging from simple things as signing and line striping up to the widening that we talked about. 
So there's a lot of challenges in implementing this. There's first of all, we're crossing through many municipalities. And when you're talking land use and coordinated projects, that's challenging. Um, many projects have a wide range of scope, scale, and costs. Not all of them rise to the level of being on the tip. Some of them are actually developer paid for. And, uh, and so it ranges that scale. And of course, we have the variety of land use strategies. So uh, at, at the, what's going to happen is Tri-County Regional Planning Commission will kind of use this tool uh, to manage implementation by coordinating with Dauphin County, the municipalities, PennDOT, HATS should be on there um, in, in using this to address the quarter needs. So with that, I'll wrap up and open it up to questions. Any questions for Brian? Wow, you got him, Brian. <laughs> Probably because I was mumbling, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, because your presentation was chock full of such great information. There you go. There you <laughs> okay. go. All right. So, so just um, in in terms of hats, I think these are both good examples of uh, of encouraging municipalities and others to do these planning studies and and coordinate with us. I don't uh, I don't think we're asking for hats action on this, as Brian indicated. Um, we see this as a tool to help us move forward on our overall transportation planning efforts. So as as was also indicated, we're making it publicly available. We'll be working with these studies, uh, you know, especially this year as we get into the tip and other things um, and working with the municipalities, as he indicated. So with that, appreciate both of you giving us uh, the update there and we'll we'll see where those studies take us. Um, moving on to the regular business, uh, the minutes from April 14th, scroll down here, oh, ah. sorry about that. There we go. Uh, so the minutes um, from April are in your packet. Um, we're looking for a, uh, any discussion or a motion for action on the on the minutes for the tech committee. Motion to approve. Yeah, it was Kirk. Is there a second? Second. Second. Ray Green, Penn Dot Central. Uh, Rich beat you to it, Ray. All right, that's all good. <laughs> so with that any further dis any further discussion all in favor aye 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 any opposed motion approved uh, as i scroll down here we also have for your information the coordinating committee meeting minutes uh, from april 28th um no action needed but does anybody have any questions or comments on the minutes from the coordinating committee Hearing none, we will move on to tip modifications, specifically starting with administrative modifications. Who's running through that today for us? John Owens will do the administrative. Your amendments. Okay. John, if you want to do that, hold, give me one second. There we go. Okay, John, so if you can give me uh, which ones you're going to run through, I'll try to highlight them on the map and we can take it from there. Okay, sounds good. Um, so just a brief overview, 32 actions since the last meeting, 13 were cash flows, 20 were increases and decreases. Um, item 30, Cameron McClay Street intersection. intersection. There we go. So this this was an increase to the low bid amount. And the other one I'm going over is item 38, US 322, Chambers Hill and Chambers Hill Road.
Give me one second, John. Sorry about that. Okay. There we go. Okay. And this was also an increase to the low bid. Uh, you'll notice items 25 and 27 are in the packet right now. This is for Market Street, the Market Street bridges. There we go. Gotcha. They're on the screen. Yeah. So those were increases to the TYP. Those uh those actions have been reversed. So they're no longer no longer to that amount. So not part of the true administrative actions at this point. Yes, correct. Uh that's all I have. If there's any questions. Anything for John? Okay, then Carrie, I said, I think you said you were going to cover the. Good morning, everyone. Uh, in your packet, there should be three uh, amendments. The first two amendments are previously approved uh, RTP projects. Um, what happened here was when we updated the DIP, uh, they never got carried over. Uh, one was actually on the DIP for $581. That's the first one. That's High Lenny Street and Connectivity in Latera Township, Dauphin County. So we're switching those uh, funds from 581 to uh, STP funds, federalized, uh, federalizing them. Uh, the second project was left off the dip during the update. That was a previous approved uh, RTP project. That's a Dairy Township uh, pedestrian crossing. So that's now being added using federal dollars, STP. Uh, both of these projects expect to let here in the fall. Okay. I'll go to the next one, then we can have other questions. And answer them. So this project is an addition to the DIP. It's a new project. Uh, it's the I-81, US-15, and 11 lighting project. This is in East Pennsborough Township at 81, 11, 15 interchange. Um, due to the fact that the new carbon reduction funds um, are part of the IIJ bill, lighting this uh, matter here is uh, uh, approved to use those funds. Um, so they are, we're using, we're going to replace 30 poles um, and we're going to replace uh, all lighting fixtures with new LED lighting. So this will be a much uh, significant energy efficient improvement at that interchange. That's for about $2.6 million um, of the uh, carbon reduction funds. And we did work with Federal Highways to get that approved for the eligibility. Okay. It's we're going to be doing some paving up there at the same time. So that project is going to go with that improvements on 1115 next step. Is that it for your amendments? That's it for the amendments. I just have one question on that one. Are there any poles added or moved around or whatever, or is it simply a replacement we're at this point? We're going to remove up to 30. I think there's 16 some up there. Oh, okay. Reduction in the number of fixtures because of Better coverage. What, what you, yeah, so, with the uh, new. We did have a lighting study completed before we were looking to figure out how we were going to include that into the pavement preservation project. So this helps us advance that and tie those two together. Okay. Uh, we have been taking fixtures out of commission as they've been not deemed safe any longer. Right. We're trying to take them down as we can. Right. Uh, but we need to, we're going to do the entire upgrade there though. Okay. All right. That was the only question I had. Does anybody else have any questions for Gary on the amendments? Hearing nothing, then I think for this, we would need a recommendation for approval of the amendments uh, to move forward to the coordinating committee. Thank you, Kirk. Is there a second? Second. I was waiting for you to beat Rich, Ray. I know, right? Thank you very much. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? If not, all in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so the motion passes.
All right, that gets us through through that. That then takes us down under program and plan updates to bike ped, Mr. Bomberger. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple things to go over. We'll start with our bike share program, Susquecycle. Uh, I kind of told everybody at the April meetings that the, the bikes are back out. The original six locations and 36 bikes uh, came back out in early April. Just this week, our, our expansion of the system began. Uh, three new stations were added, one at the Bethesda Mission right across the street from the federal new, the new federal courthouse. Uh, we have a rack now at Tri-County Community Action on Derry Street, kind of between 14th and 15th. Um, and then we have a station in downtown Hummelstown that connects to the Hershey Bikes, which is what they could, which is what kind of Penn State Health calls their existing bike share. So and on the back end, there is really no difference. You'll be, you can use the bikes as the, you can use Sussex Cycle bikes and Hershey bikes if you're, if you're an annual member of either, really. So um, I think we're really happy about making that connection and, and kind of building on some of the stuff that's already been done. Uh, if I could just real quick, since we're talking about Hershey, the one thing I'll say that happened this month relating to this is, we had some really good outreach with the Visitors Bureau, sure. Visit Harris, Hershey Harrisburg, I guess it is. Um, they were anxious, uh, especially with the kind of the Hershey connection, um, to help us market specifically the tourism industry, but uh, the use overall. So I think that's a good example of somebody reaching out, you know, being interested in this program and reaching out and wanting to help uh, get the word out. So I just yeah. thought I'd throw that in. Thanks. Uh, we're still waiting on three additional stations, uh, Paxang Parkway at Derry Street, the State Office Complex at North and Commonwealth, and then Transit Park at Market and 10th. We're still working through some issues with uh, uh, property owners and, and, and kind of dotting I's and crossing T's there. But we anticipate those to come out uh, later this summer. Um, sponsorships are still available. We have thousand dollar five hundred dollar even one hundred dollar levels and you get free membership plus some other benefits if you're interested please contact me or you can go to our website susquecycle.org um yeah that say would have any questions about bike share moving on our active transportation plan is off and running uh we're collecting municipal outreach surveys right now We'll be holding a municipal outreach meeting next Thursday, June 15th. Uh, right now we're focused on collecting, compiling and digitizing local plans. Karen Dixon, one of our new staff members has been helping out a lot with that, um, kind of building on what we've already mapped and, and done in our long range plan. You know, but it, it is quite a task going through and making sure we have everything that's already been done kind of collected on one central map so we can start to see where you know where all these existing planning studies are already kind of showing us where the connections should be uh there's there's also a public survey and whip and wiki mapping available uh we're working on some promotional materials uh, i'm reaching out to the steering committee members and regional partners once that's complete and i should i'll, I'll add we we had our first our steering committee meeting as well last week I guess that was, yes. yeah, last week. Um, and we have a regional partners, which is kind of what we're calling like our stakeholders. So the bike pet advocates, the uh, other organizations, kind of um, related yeah. organizations, Recycle Bicycle, but even like our regional trail organizations, we'll be getting them all together for a meeting uh, at the end of June. Um, and then moving forward, we'll also be doing some key, some key stakeholder interviews as well. So that's kind of what we'll be doing through the summer. You'll see us at, at some events in the summer and then into the fall as we kind of really continue the, the outreach process for this plan. If you have any questions about the active transportation plan, please contact me. If you have any questions right now, I can try to address them. If not, I got one more thing. Okay. Last thing is that the transportation alternative set aside application round is open. 
Uh, it opened on May 30th. Draft applications are due July, 7, July 17th. Final applications are due September 15th. And coordination with us and PennDOT is required. So if this is generally for municipalities, um, are, are, are the most likely project sponsors. So if you're on the phone or if you're on the meeting and you're a municipality and you're interested in this, please contact me. We can talk through whatever idea uh, you have. Um, I do wanna mention that as a large MPO, we get our own allocation for TASA in addition to the statewide. You scroll back up, Steve. So as part of that uh, large MPO allocation, we actually set our own eligibility criteria. A little more, two pages up, right there. Perfect, about one more. So we actually set our own criteria. If you look in the statewide guidance, there's, there's I think, 11 uh, different project eligib eligibility categories. We actually narrow that down to three and really focus on the kind of plain old bike ped facilities. We, we, we do not consider the more ancillary activities like stormwater management and some of that stuff to be an eligible category for the HATS allocation. Now, people could still apply through the program. Um, and if their project is predominantly one of those other non-eligible categories through this document, they would still be eligible for the statewide round. And if, you're, and if you have a project that is predominantly one of these categories, but also contains some elements of those other categories, we would continue, we would consider you eligible for us. So I just wanted to provide that. That's just some info here. I'm not asking for action on this. It's how we've handled it the past, I don't know, since 2014, since I've been here. So just staying consistent with how we've done it. And then this is just a quick um, document to kind of lay out how we do our, our evaluations. That'll be provided to PennDOT uh in in july so just kind of an fyi so again any questions with tasa let me know anything overall for andrew hearing nothing all right um that moves us on to operations and safety and I, i'll give you a quick update there on a couple of things um, one i know we've shown this before uh you guys are probably aware that we did uh what we call our online safety app, which takes advantage of PennDOT's PSIT data and puts it in a much more, I'll say user-friendly uh, format that can even now be screened down if you're just interested in data for your individual municipality, we added that capability to it. So if you're you know, a township or whatever, and you wanna see what your crash history has been like over the last couple of years, you can get onto the Tri-County website under transportation and then safety, you can link right to it and it's it's fairly easy to use anybody has any questions feel free to reach out um, we are going to be updating it a little this month the uh, 2022 data the preset data will be available to us sometime later this month so it's a five-year crash history it'll soon be 2018 to, through 2022 instead of 17 through 21 so we'll do the look for that uh, and that should be available by Fourth of July kind of a time frame, something like that, if not earlier. So that's one of the tools, though, that we've been working on and refining. Because as we've mentioned before, also um, we were uh, successful in obtaining a federal Safe Streets for All grant um, to do a safety plan for the region. So having that data and being able to work with it and whatever is critical in that front. Um, and I think that my last update was we were working through the bureaucracy. No offense. Um, to get approval to move forward. Um, we've since received that uh, approval. So we're at the point of uh, signing the contract with the consultants that we're gonna be working with. And I, I think we have a very good, Andrew was talking about steering committee for active transportation plan. I think we have a very good steering committee in the works for this safety plan with emergency service providers, public works people, municipal representatives from some of these areas of focus. Um, so I'm looking forward to that, and it will be a the the subject 
for our annual luncheon next year. I think we'll pull that steering committee together and let them kind of explain to everybody some of the strategies and things that we've come up with uh, through the safety plan. So really looking forward to that effort uh, underway, hoping to wrap it up before next year's cycle of, of Safe Streets money is available. So we can go after implementation funds because that's obviously the, the goal here with everything is to be able to actually secure the funding necessary to make uh, valuable improvement. So stay tuned, any questions on that, uh, feel free to reach out. And at last but not least, more operationally, um, we've mentioned periodically this effort uh, to do a congestion management process, uh, not so much for HATS, but for the district wide. So in coordination with our other MPOs here, uh, we have now uh, provided that scope of work to our friends um, at uh, SRTP. They're costing that out so we can work with the department on the funding mechanisms for it. So, but we hope to have that underway here in the near future as well. So that's my operational and safety update, unless anybody has any questions for me. Not a question, just one quick note on that bureaucracy. Uh, just that's, that's fine, I'm a bureaucrat, so not ashamed of it. Um, but just just for the good of the group, you know, from a federal perspective, you know, the bipartisan infrastructure law, IJA, whatever you want to call it, you know, these it, it contains these direct grants, as in PennDOT is not a party to this, as is done. So the vast majority of everything is done in the whole country goes through stewardship and oversight agreements through one through one process, through these state DOTs, so that how federal rules are followed, frankly all flow through one point of contact at the state DOT. And this is a sea change, seismic shift for the entire country uh, because of the new laws. Now these are going directly. So some states are having, you know, gone from having zero to 50 overnight, which means that the people at PennDOT, the good people at PennDOT and other state DOTs around the country who do this every day, do this for a living, make sure that all these processes, they've been doing for decades, they are instantly out of the equation. Sorry. So, <laughs> no, I'm just heartbroken. Now. Yes. So, so just so you know, <laughs> so yeah, so we, have, you know, we, we've actually, we as an organization, Federal Highway Administration, we are, we are hiring. I mean, we are, we are, because suddenly all of those things that, you know, that the, these experts do at DOTs across the country, they are, they are no longer involved in. And indeed, it, it is definitely a completely different change. And um, and we do, we do a risk-based approach to everything we do, right? And now we have different risks that exist, not related to the Harrisburg, right. just nationally. Right. So just sharing, sharing that with you. So we appreciate, you know, obviously the opportunity to work with you on that. I wasn't personally involved, I'm sure Gene was, but uh, but I've been involved with this. And, and this is a big, it's a big yeah. thing nationally. We look forward to working with you. Yeah. We're, we're learning how to request funding directly from Federal Highway. So and, and, the, and the financial system called FEMIS that we use with uh, PennDOT every day for, for massive money transfers um, does not apply. So okay. it's a completely different financial system. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's different from our end as well. But before Rich celebrates too much, we did put them on the steering committee. So yeah. you're still involved. Sorry, we're not letting you out of it then. And we're, and we're happy here. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Thanks for the input. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, looking forward to all those things. So there's some, I think, going to be some really interesting uh, things coming out of those. Not just, don't think of it as just infrastructure improvements, too, in terms of safety. You know, one of the things that I looked at quickly with that safety app is in terms of fatalities and serious injuries, it's between 40 and 50 percent of those are DUI related. So there's things that are going to need done as implementation if we're gonna really get rid of some of these more significant crashes that are not directly related to physical improvements to the roadway. So it's gonna be a, hopefully a full range of things, much like the Federal Highway Strategy is not just focused on infrastructure uh, improvements in terms of safety. So anyway, sorry, I'm done. Uh, so if there's nothing more on that, then we get to the tip development 
uh, thing for your information back to Andrew. Sure, just a quick um, update. We've received both the general procedural guidance as well as the financial guidance from central office. We've also received uh, kind of the initial candidate projects from, from District 8. We're currently reviewing them. Once our internal review is, is complete, we'll actually be holding a uh, RTP implementation work group uh, meeting to kind of kick off tip development. So we have that group hasn't worked, hasn't met in a little while, and we might have to have some discussions about about membership and 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 that. But it's typically one person from each county um, and the city. And then representatives from Pendai, whether it's a district or central office, and, and then us. And if anybody else is interested, I think we'd welcome participation from any other groups as well. Um, but it's basically the working group that goes through the tip development process and, and then kind of the, the, the first step of review. And then this is kind of the second step, this committee, and then the third is our coordinating committee. So, um, you know, we, we had two two presentations on earlier kind of related to some, I guess, potential tip projects down the road. We will be, I'll use that as a segue to, you know, we're always kind of trying to update our, our project pipeline. We're analyzing what's on there right now to make sure once we're kind of in, in tip development uh, in earnest that that pipeline is up to date and current. Uh, and and contains kind of uh, the the you know what communities are are prioritizing right now and and what they're supporting right now. So you'll be hearing more about that in future meetings. Andrew, with that, with the, I know it's still early. Sure. But looking at the carryover projects, what's your anticipation for capacity to add new projects? So I will say that we have not gotten any carryover projects. These are cut. We've we've got the candidate projects, which are kind of the here's what will potentially need to be added. We I don't not to put carry on the slide. He might think, have a better sense I of was that. Hoping you'd say so. Yeah, <laughs> we provided the MPO staff with actually the bridge candidate. We don't have the roadway candidates yet. We just wrapped up what we call our AP ride for the county managers. You know, Amy is well in a van and they ride the roads um, and see conditions. Then they'll compile that list. I'm still waiting on that to provide that to Andrew. And also, we have not received any uh, safety candidates um, for the highway screening tool yet. From what I was told, I think that's going to be August um, for those locations. Uh, but, you know, maybe it'll come sooner. But uh, as far as carryover, you still have some projects that are, are pretty big. We have the one on 581 out here, the preservation. That will probably be maybe carry over to some other ones. Um, you know, we'd have to crunch the numbers to give you an actual procedure. But the bridge candidates, pretty much our bridge engineer went through the dip down scopes on projects. Um, and, you know, he kind of did a lot of the work for the carryover projects already. Some of those estimates have to be refined because it went off a, a formula-based number, which may identify the smaller structure with you know a smaller right-of-way number, but it's not out there to see that it might be a higher number. So he kind of did that, and then he gave MPO just a candidate of bridge numbers that they'll plug into the you know you can do it your RTP work. So. And and just to clarify, that's the presentation that they're essentially the outputs of the presentation that Derek Mitch gave in. February or April, oh, I think February. So we're on our way, I think is the, is the takeaway. Yeah, yeah, but just just because you brought up bridges and candidates, the other thing I wanna add is we, I've been talking to Carrie here recently. Uh, everyone will remember the local bridge line item that we added to this current tip. Um, working with him, each of the counties, Kirk, as you know, have identified a handful of candidates for bridges, typically something or other like that. We're working with Carrie to get that, uh, you know, that generic line item converted over into the individual bridges that we will move forward so we can have numbers assigned and start on the design process. So that's, that's you know, we just had that conversation here the other day. Um, we're working towards getting that so that we can start moving, even 
do some of the preliminary work, preliminary work so that we can better understand exactly what the appropriate treatments on some of those will be. So it's in the works. It's in the I works. know that's, that's an important project for us. And you know, talking with all these guys here, it's one for them. So we're really excited to see that. I think that line item really helps us address local needs. Sometimes, you know, there's a lot of big needs in the region. To be able to address those local needs is really important. We appreciate all yeah. the work that has been done. So we're getting there. There's three million in 2025, and they're saying that yeah, um, million accounting per year would be was the numbers that we had assigned, and now we're breaking that out into the individual bridge priorities. So that yep. will be a carryover. Yep. On our next step later. Yep. All right. Thanks. Sorry, I wanted to throw that oh, in. Yeah. Do we have anything else under tip I development? Do, I do not. Urbanized area boundary update. Uh, so HAT staff has completed the draft update of the smooth urbanized area associated with the 2020 census. Uh, the smoothing is really only used for transportation planning purposes like functional classification, you know, whether a collector road is an urban collector versus a rural collector. Uh, it, and it doesn't impact the official urbanized area used by the census. Um, our focus really was making sure roads didn't kind of go back and forth, jumping between urban and rural designations. So kind of focusing on having continuous corridors and, and, and areas that kind of made sense with what was on the ground. Um, we're coordinating with the surrounding MPOs as, as, as required. Uh, draft changes can be viewed in the web map that's available both in this draft letter as well as it's in the, the, the link is also in the uh, additional information memo at the beginning of the packet. Uh, we need to submit this to PennDOT by the end of the month. So I'm asking for a formal re recommendation to permit us to do so. Any questions on this for Andrew? And you see any major changes? Well, the, I mean, the biggest changes is that urban clusters are no longer a thing. So we did lose some some areas that were defined as urban clusters that are now no longer considered urban. That's probably the biggest change. And when we did the smoothing, we did not, we really just smoothed the boundaries. We did not kind of establish new urbanized areas. So we, census gives us a basically a shape file. We review that um and make sure it kind of makes sense in that so if you have a road and the and the polygon is kind of doing this and it would there were instances where it would be going urban rural urban rural or so that's where we kind of smoothed it out and made sure it was kind of a logical shape and we used census blocks as the or yeah census blocks as the geometry for that designation so that we can use you know so that we can still have kind of consistency and the ability to analyze it. Any other questions on this? If not, then I guess we're looking for a, a motion to recommend a signature on the letter that you can see on the screen. So moved. Kirk, is there a second? Second. Oh, there we go. That was Ray. All right. Uh, we have any further discussion? If not, all in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passed. Uh, funded studies. You want me to? I'll give a quick update here. Downtown circulation uh, slash Market Street. If you remember, this is a study that we have uh, has been ongoing for maybe a little over a month. Um, looking at, uh, you know, we call it downtown circulation because it's not only Market Street, but also looking at Chestnut and Walnut and all roads in between onto the Market Street Bridge. Looking at um, feasibility of uh, one thing is two way travel on Market Street as the transfer center for CAT uh, or SRTA moves further east. Those buses are then no longer able to come straight across Market onto the West Shore. So we wanted to see if we couldn't facilitate some better transit service um, through these improvements. Uh, we met this month with Jeff uh, and others, and we'll be having, uh, we have some, we have the background conditions pretty well laid out. We're moving into 
okay, what's the future traffic look like and what are some of the options? So that's where we'll be moving uh, before the next meeting. Uh, but just wanted to give you an update on that. And then in terms of RTP implementation grant projects, Carrie ran through a couple of them here that we were getting the funding in place to make sure that we didn't miss let dates and things. I think those, my understanding is those RTP implementation grant projects are moving forward as scheduled for the most part. Um, we're still working with some of the municipalities that had um, planning or construction projects in the second round that we awarded to kind of get them moving and, uh, and off the ground. So again, things are moving forward. We're probably what? Are we a year away from another round? I think that's, yep. uh, but anyway, they are all, and it's a smattering of municipalities from across the region that are involved in those. So any, any questions on funded studies? Hearing nothing, I think back to Andrew on project pipeline. Yeah, and I, I'll just reiterate what I said a couple of minutes ago during the tip development uh, portion. You know, we're going through the, the pipeline, trying to incorporate some of these new things, talking to municipalities, seeing what their priorities are. Um, and, and you'll be hearing more moving forward. Okay. Projects in development. Is it uh, Gary? We have a few, not as much, not much change since our last meeting. Uh, so the first one here is the river land safety limitation um, up on uh, 322 area there. Um, we're still waiting to schedule a public meeting. That will take place sometime uh, later this summer. Fall. Um, our Sporting Hills Burn Lane in Hamden Township, uh, the alternative analysis report was provided to Tri-County. A meeting will be set up to discuss uh, this Monday. I think. Yeah, I think it's Monday. Okay. It said June 2023 here. So I'm yeah, right. I think it's Monday. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> uh, also, the Route uh, 34 turn lanes. This is up in Carroll Township, Perry County. The alternative analysis report for the four intersections is to be completed here in June. And then we will solicit input from Carroll Township and Tri County early summer uh, at end of June 2000. One item I want to mention here is the Sheepers Road Bridge Rehab Project. It is listed on the York County tip, but it borders Cumberland and York. So uh, right now, PennDOT is soliciting uh, public input um, until July 3rd. There was a press release that went out if anyone gets those PennDOT press releases. There's some links on that. If anyone wants to forward them that press release, I can't. And Rich, you want to talk about the uh, South Bridge? Yeah, I wanted to uh, provide an update on where we're at with the South Bridge. Uh, we we are working as for the central office to, to advance the South Bridge project. Um, it is officially been pulled from the major bridge P3 initiative. It's back as a district project. Um, we have all hands on deck in the district to keep moving forward with preliminary design on that with the goal of letting that project next summer as a design build type project. Uh, we are working right now with the team in central office to still look to apply for some federal discretionary grants to help, I'll say offset some funding, but we do, working through our program center, we do have the, the projects um, funded to move forward. So uh, there is, Hope that we'll get discretionary grants. I believe the team maybe had a meeting. They reached out to us. Yeah, reached out to to help solicit information for cost benefit uh, updating as part of the application, um, and we'll be soliciting uh, at some point here hopeful support from our elected officials, businesses, tourism, whatever we can do to get support to, right. to help. Hopefully. Uh, have a successful grant application uh, but i did want to provide that update so it's, uh, at the district level it's it's really all hands on deck to move forward we have support of our executive staff the central office to take care of the south bridge so is that it for projects and development like you mentioned we put in for these grants before we didn't have the project fully funded so now having it fully funded 
Yeah, it's very odd. That, uh, you have to show that you have the money you before you can ask for the money. <laughs> you can apply for That's extremely convenient. And it's it's like, it sounds like getting a mortgage. It, it is kind of, it's kind of odd. But, it's not uh, odd, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, this is the, you know, it, there's always an issue of, you know, you, you, the question is, you know, you put in, somebody puts in for the grant, well, is this in your long range plan? Yes. Is it in your, is it in your TIF? You know, yes or no. Except for there's this thing called fiscal constraint. Mm -hmm. Where it doesn't get in your plan or your tip unless you can prove you have the money to do it, which is kind of a catch twenty two with putting in for a grant. Right. So yes, ideal situation if you can say, hey, it's funny. It is, but we could use the help. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, we got better things to use our own money. On. Exactly, and yeah. that's and that's what the that's what the goal is. And and uh, you know, if we're not successful this year, we're going to keep applying. You know, as as NOCOs open up for those those federal grants, in the hope that will be successful in one year or another and be able to I'll say utilize those out year funds for other projects like uh, across the state. So and I, I, you you mentioned the NOFOs. I just want to remind specifically the municipalities on on here. PennDOT had a PennDOT Connects meeting when was it two weeks ago? And at that meeting they talked about you know, we're, we're talking about these federal discretionary grants and there are a lot of them. And there is a lot of them to try to keep track of. PennDOT actually developed a, a handbook to kind of walk municipalities through the process of getting information, applying the whole kind of the whole process. So I don't have a link handy. I, I think it's on the PennDOT Connects website. It's on the website. PennDOT website under the PennDOT Connects uh, tab. Yeah. So if anybody's interested in finding that, get in contact with me and we can we can point you in the right direction. So I just wanted to mention that because it is a it, it's a great opportunity, but it's a complex opportunity. So and, and I'll just say real quick, um, you know, all the insights you know, we weren't asking for, but just once again from a federal perspective, it is a brave new world with all of these discretionary grant programs. And and it's and it's so it's so large, you know. And to your point, there are so many options out there that you know now it's it's you know yes, there's been raised and infra you know versions in the past, but now when we see um, you know MPOs like yes yeah, doing a, a long range transportation plan, um, and you're going to do your fiscal constraint, you're going to have to say, well, these are our funding sources, and you're going to have to figure out how to consider those discretionary grants, and and there are so many. There's so many out there that it really, um, you know, for MPOs in that regional decision making, that project selection of which projects are you picking, you have things like CASA where you have a defined role sure. currently. The discretionary grants are not as much of a discretionary role, or as you know, a, a role that you know that is defined like that. But there's still a role for the MPO right. as far as you know how do the various options fit in with your long range plan. So it's, it's, a, it's, like I said, a brave new world. Right. And trying to align the discretionary sources that are there for how three more years now with a 20 year plan. <laughs> yes, you have to Even make more complicated. You have to make reasonable assumptions. Yeah. yeah. Terry, I think you. My question was going to be Patrick. No, we just met today, but. Yeah. My thinking is, you know, this bill is only five years, federal infrastructure bill, with all this grant and all this money, but there's not a defined funding source um, after that five years. What, what's going to be the, has there been any talks at federal highways that what's going to happen after this bill expires? Because we don't have, it's not like a gas tax. It's not some, some good news. Is, I, I, I was admittedly still in college when ice tea was passed. <laughs> okay, but. <laughs> but but that notwithstanding, you know, we've had Ice T and T21 and Math Act, you know, Math the Fast Act. I've I've heard that question um, every you know however many years since you know I did graduate from college in 1995, and and it's it's a matter of making reasonable assumptions for what the future holds, because because um, I used to be on the other side of the table. I used to get together with the MPO directors and say, let's all agree on a reasonable assumption for. And I think that's in the financial guidance here, but, you know, but that's, that's been happening. I did that. I was doing that 15 years ago and, you know, a different state somewhere of let's, let's figure out what an amount of money, uh, reasonable growth is for federal money in the future. 
So, so it's a valid question, but it's it's one that you you still have to you still have to make assumptions going forward because we've been in this seat right. one version or another many times. Yep. Nice try, Gary. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious. <laughs> I don't know if there was anything. <laughs> any yeah. Well, and, and, it's, and it definitely varies by MPO. But sure. I was recently working with a very, uh, you know, a DVRPC sized MPO, and they put in their long range plan that this other MPO that you know they're going to assume a certain amount of discretionary grants going into the future, and right. it was conservative and it was reasonable and appropriate and all these good words. But it was a reasonable assumption that if you're a, you know, if you're a big enough area, you are going to get at least some piece of the pie with all of these opportunities. You can't tell you, you can't say that you're going to get a mega grant 2028 specifically, but right. but there is there are reasonable assumptions you got to make. Yeah. Any any further comments or questions on projects in development? Hearing none, that moves us to status reports, specifically PennDOT. Richard, do you guys have anything further to add to what was already been said? Anything from central office, Ray or Matt? Nope, I'm good there. All right, so we'll move past PennDOT. We do not have representation today from the STC, so that'll move us to Federal Highway. We have more federal highway representation than we normally do. So I'll, I'll pass it to Gene and see if either of you guys have anything else to add. Yeah, we had a couple things we wanted to mention. Uh, first thing is USDOT is inviting public comment to uh, inform the annual update of the, what's called the DOT Equity Action Plan, which aims to look at um, expanding access and opportunity to uh, all communities. Um, there's a request for information to collect that public comment that's gonna be open through June 30th. In addition to that, there's going to be a, a virtual meeting that'll be held uh, two weeks from today on Friday, June 23rd, uh, from one to three in the afternoon on Zoom. Um, and during that webinar, there'll be an opportunity to kind of talk directly with DOT staff who are like involved in doing the equity related work uh, for the administration. Um, once I get back to the office, I will uh, share those links with with hats to both the uh, the public comment and also for the webinar. And I can also share the link again to uh, the list that Federal Highway maintains for the uh, current NOFO opportunities. Yeah. Appreciate that, Gene. Um, speaking of those, um, there's a couple application deadlines I just kind of wanted to mention as we're, we're talking about the discretionary grant opportunities. Um, June 13th, which is in a couple days, the charging of uh, fueling infrastructure discretionary grant deadline. Um, then on July 10th, the current funding for the Safe Streets uh, for all program, uh, we have July 26, which really doesn't apply here. That's port facilities. But uh, August 1st, wildlife crossings pilot program, and August 18th, the protect uh, grants are uh, the deadline for those is, is approaching. Thanks, so, Gene. and that's the protect discretionary. Yes, yeah, protect right. discretionary. as compared to the protect right the formula, the, the formula fund. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And then just one more. Uh, Federal Highway has recently updated their guidance on bicycle and pedestrian planning and a project development. And I will also uh, share that link with the MPO as well. Sure. And I'll, Patrick, if you have anything else. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Hey, I'm going to, I just got, I saw in the chat, um, I'm going to shift over to city of Harrisburg. I think uh, Jeff Knight had to go in a couple of minutes. Jeff, if you're still there, do you have an update from the city side? Uh, no, I don't think we have like really a formal update, uh, aside from, um, I believe we've had a, a new, um, uh, staff member be added to the, uh, coordinating your technical committee, uh, Jason Graves, um, so that we'll have additional representation here from the city's, uh, perspective. I'm not sure if he's on today or not. Um, we'll have additional representation from the city's perspective, uh, for these meetings. So it will not just be me. And I'll, I'll Jeff, thanks, but I, can you send me an email or something to that effect? Yeah, I think we did already. We we sent you the city council um, legislation that is assigned him that. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll check and coordinate with you, Jeff. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, having heard now, I'll go back to regional partners, SRTA. I don't remember if Beth or any, I don't believe anyone registered today or was able to attend. Uh, from the transit authority so uh and i don't think anyone's on from sarah um 
I will, you know, you see Norfolk Southern on there. I, I will provide an update on that. Um, you remember at the last round of meetings, I mentioned that there was a new point of contact that uh, took what was Rudy Husband's place. Um, we were able to have him come here uh, to our office a week and a half or two weeks ago, I think it was. Uh, and he sat down with basically the officers from the coordinating committee. So Jeff Haste was here, Gene Foshi was here, Brenda Watson was here from Perry County, uh, and sit down and talk with him on the kind of the, to give him some background knowledge on the kinds of, th you know, the projects that HATS has ongoing that have a rail component to them and issues like you know, derailments and all the other things that you're hearing about these days. And I think I think everyone left that meeting with uh, a positive uh, perspective that fellow's name is Jeremy Shoemaker, um, that he was willing to, you know, he, he admitted to us he wasn't going to be able to answer all our questions, but he agreed to be a point of contact if we had an issue to get to him to get to the right people at Norfolk Southern. So it was a promising discussion. Um, we've also provided him with uh, the calendar of HATS meetings, and we did get a notice from him, travels around a lot in his region, that he wasn't able to do it today, but he's keeping those dates on the schedule and hopes to be with us uh, here in the foreseeable future. So I, I thought that was a positive step uh, to have that discussion. So I just thought I would bring it up um, while we were talking about partners. Steve, can uh, you push out his point of contact to the group? Oh, yeah, I can do that. Thank you, sir. Sure. Um, we also, I don't believe we have anyone from Amtrak or PMTA or even the Turnpike uh, on today. I think that moves me to Mr. Boyer with SRTP. The depth of this barrel is getting pretty low when you get down to us, you know, at least we're here. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, just a quick update from our uh, commuter services, the PA team and the SRTP. Uh, certainly over the past uh, month, our outreach team's been out and about. They've been busy with uh, career link fairs, which are both beneficial for employers and employees trying to get over transportation obstacles. We've had a number of employer fairs where uh, hiring is obviously of utmost importance, and a uh, number of our employer partners have invited us in to help uh, bridge those gaps between where people are trying to get employment, where they live, and how they get back and forth. From a uh, promotion standpoint, uh, we did have a staffing agency showdown in the last month that pitted the uh, the staffing agencies from certain areas of our nine county region against each other, trying to have their clients track their trips in our, our commute PA database. Obviously, the month of May, uh, another very successful bike month, um, not only in on-site activities with some of our uh, employers who have biking facilities, but also uh, some of our on-site rides, such as the one we had in Berks County, that uh, the Berks County ride, rather nice one. Not only did it have a, a riding component, but we were also successful in a, a public-private partnership to donate two brand new Trek Police e-bikes to uh, two of the municipalities there. So, uh, really nice hand, really nice hand-in-hand -hand, uh, community operation. Uh, from a transportation demand management point of view, our team, uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, or as Andrew has mentioned, is, is part of the Regional Bike Share Initiative. Uh, it's great to have awesome partners like HATS and the things that you're doing so that those that are just getting into the space can see what the potential is and, and how far they can go with that. Uh, we also, as Steve mentioned, are working on the congestion, uh, regional congestion mitigation plan. Uh, that ball is in our court. We will hope to have that uh, cost estimate wrapped up next week when one of my fellow team members gets back for some PTO. Um, Steve, you mentioned Perry County. We're still waiting on that return uh, answer from the National Science Foundation grant that was uh, put in in conjunction with Penn State University. So we anxiously await that potential grant funding. Uh, and from a uh, from a TDM point of view, we also we uh, SRTP has started the preparation of our preliminary application for TA set aside funding to stand up a, a safe routes to schools system uh, somewhere across our nine counties. So. We're going to be preparing that in a region, regional-wide basis with uh, the opportunities for two or three pilot projects to kick that off in, in our nine-county area. Uh, to get out of the way of the rest of the meeting, our Commute PA database in the last month did track 140 new people who joined our database. Uh, those people that are tracking trapped about 9,400 trips. That's over 150,000 miles taken off the road based just on those few that tracked for us. 
uh, and a cost savings based on current gas prices of about $94,000 stuck back in the pockets of our participants just in the last month. So uh, with that, I'll get out of the way unless there's any questions, but appreciate the opportunity to offer the HATS board a, an update on our activities. Thanks, Matt. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, anything for Matt? All right, thanks again. Uh, DCED, we we do have, uh, Rachel Resnick is, is I believe, uh, still on the line. We actually had the opportunity to meet with her and she's our, uh, I'll say new DCED point of contact. Uh, so the staff here sat down with her recently, but Rachel, I don't know if you had anything you might wanna uh, say to the group as a whole. Uh, I do not have anything to update, but yeah, I will be now the new point of contact as Steve said. So uh, she moved on from our office, which I'm pretty sure a good majority of you are fully aware of or working with him at least. But uh, yeah, I look forward to working with all of you. All right. Welcome, Rachel. With that, I don't think we have DCNR representation. I, I believe I saw Matt Stone wrote. I don't know if there were other uh, legislator reps on today. Is any, anybody have anything for a legislator's report? I do not. I just, the representative is sitting here listening in as well. So, Dave, thank you for all you do. And please keep us apprised of the 39 project. Thanks. And I hope everybody has a great weekend. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, then moving back to local reports, I, I know we do have folks from various municipalities. I think I saw Carlisle and some others. Do any of you have anything, uh, Lemoyne, to say for the HATS committee? Hey, this You're is Jeff Brooks, and I, I do not, yeah. but thanks for the opportunity. It's great to All sit right. in. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Steve, Gail here. How you doing? All right. How are you? Fine, thanks. Hey, uh, regarding the bike share program, are there still locations being considered in Lemoyne? Yeah, we're. There, I'll say this, Gail. You're on the list. Um, you know, not for this year because we just got through the uh, uh, process. I'm just going to say process, Rich, um, to to get this current sites approved, but. We, we have been actually talking with PennDOT and Federal Highways on the environmental component that we need to go through for that. And I, I think we have uh, some ideas for looking at sites like Lemoyne kind of ahead of time so uh -huh. that we can, uh, you know, we'll get that environmental clearance, hopefully, if we're going there in the near future, and then won't have to have a lengthy thing when we're ready to, uh, to place bikes. So you're on the list. Uh, along with a handful of others. Uh, and we might be in touch here in the near future to kind of fine tune a spot that we might uh, try to get clearance for. And I'll, I'll just add that when we update TIP here in a few months or you know over the next year or so, one of the things we'll be looking at is, is uh, ma making sure the CMAC allotment that, that funds 80% of this bike share is kind of you know in line with, with the amount of bike share we want to see. All our funding right now is kind of spoken for, but you know, I, I think based on the success of the program, I can say we have 180 annual members right now, and that I, we were just meeting with our uh, with our vendor yesterday, and she was kind of blown away at the number of members we had. So, and that that's over three months. Well, April. Yeah. The bike I mean, well, it was six six weeks last fall. And then basically two months this year, we've got 182 people already. So I think there's a good case to be made for some additional funding being dedicated to that. And Lemoyne is certainly on the list to receive some of that. Lemoyne's on the list. And don't don't feel bad about this, but there are some others. PAC has reached out to us. Uh, I'll call it the new Jewish Community Center, which was Dixon uh, University Center up on Front Street. They reached out. There's been a handful of other people that have heard about that. And in some cases, um, you know, the interest in having access to bikes uh, was, but the, in one in particular, I'll say the location wasn't one that we thought lended itself well to being part of the bike share program, but we were able to put them in touch with Ross at Recycle Bicycle uh, as another way of getting bikes uh, to the folks at that particular facility. So this overall topic, I think there's definitely demand for that, that we're 
now part of. Great. Thank so, you very much. Appreciate yep. the update. Not a problem. Any other municipal input? Counties. Um, I'm looking at Kirk first. I'll see, Kirk, do you have anything? Sure, just uh, real quick, since the last meeting, uh, the Cumberland County Commissioners approved what we're calling our free seat transportation program, Cumberland County Connects Transportation Program. It uses our uh, $5 local use fee that was authorized by Act 89, generates about $1.2 million per year uh, for the county. We're going to invest that in our local infrastructure, municipally and county owned infrastructure. Uh, first step in the process is our, our county small bridge program. So it'll be bridges with a span length of 8 to 20 feet. Uh, there's recently a TAC report done several years ago noting that that infrastructure really is, has been ignored. You know, there's a lot of funding sources that, that aren't eligible for those types of bridges. So we're going to invest in that. We, we put out notices to our municipalities. We have 22 of our 24 municipalities with eligible bridges that have signed on to the program. So we're really enthusiastic about it. Sent out a note uh, yesterday to find out other municipalities who weren't on our initial list of about 143 bridges. We found out they're bringing other bridges ahead. Uh, for consideration that weren't on the initial inventory. So we think it's an area of need. We want to invest in that. After we get an assessment of how much money we're going to place into that program, we also want to look back out to our municipalities to look at needs on the local system. So local highways and bridges that may not be eligible for some of the federal and state funds that are out there. So we're excited about it. We also think there's some opportunities to leverage uh, TIP funds. Uh, so we've been talking to Andrew and Steve about ways to do that. So you know, thanks to our commissioners for, for having the foresight to keep that fee in place. We don't have enough money as it stands now, and that $1.2 million can go a long way to address a lot of our local transportation. Cool. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, I believe Steve Libhart, I can't remember if there's anyone else on from Dauphin County. Is there anything to uh, share from Dauphin County's perspective? We have been talking about local bridges, and that's been a big area of focus, you know, and that, that's basically on I'll call a kind of a parallel path to what Kirk just talked about. So yeah, Steve, this is Steve Lipark. Can you hear me now? I was having problems yes, with my microphone. I'm with you. Okay. Yeah, we don't have anything specifically to add. I mean, typically as I, I think as this group knows, we're we're pretty aggressive in in our on in our upkeep of county owned bridges and, and that that continues. Um aside from that, I don't have much to add. All right. Thanks, Steve. Uh, okay, and I don't believe we have anyone on right now from Perry County. Pause just to make sure I'm correct. All right, um, that gets us to other business. I don't have any other business. Does anyone else here in the room have anything that for anybody online that hasn't otherwise been discussed for the good of the order? One thing I bring up recently, we we're working with Carl Brown and some others. There's a federal program that Climate Pollution Reduction Program. Uh, so that was looking at investing in we have the top 76 M MPOs or metropolitan areas in the nation for climate action type planning. And there, there's a funding program for about $5 billion following the deals that. I know we haven't had a lot of discussions past on climate action planning. Just want to throw it out there. I, I think it might be an issue to look into. We've developed a program in Cumberland County through uh, a DEP program, but when we look at it from an MPO level, it might be something we want to look into in the future. It appears there's a lot of money out there for us uh, for those type purposes, and it might be a good opportunity for us to come together and tap some other resources that maybe we haven't seen in the past. Any thoughts to add to Kirk's comment there, reactions? Something I think we can consider. Kirk. All right, any other business? Hearing none, do we have a motion for adjournment? That's Rich. Hey, the motion, is there a second? Right. Yeah, great, exactly. <laughs> Ray, how about it? Second, Ray Green. Thank you, thank you, Ray. Thank you for unmuting. Uh, all right, all in favor, aye. All right. Everybody have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you.